The topic in chapter 19 is probability, and there are a number of probability functions built into R. Those functions that are built in are very well organized. This is a great example of good software design. They begin with the following letters. If the function name begins with a D, it is going to give you little f of x. Now little f of x, if it is a discrete random variable, will be the probability mass function. If it is a continuous random variable, then it will be the probability density function. If it begins with the letter P, it will give you the cumulative distribution function, which is the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to a particular value. If the first letter of the function name starts with a Q, it will give you a quantile of the distribution. And finally, if the function name begins with an R, it will throw you one or more random variates from that particular distribution. So let's start with, in this case, the normal distribution. Now for the normal distribution, the two parameters are mu, which defaults to zero, and that is the population mean, and sigma, which is the population standard deviation, which defaults to one. Not all distributions have defaults, but the normal distribution does. So at this point, if we type in denorm, and put in a value, let's say 1.5. What this gives you is the normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and of course that is called the standard normal distribution. And this will give you the height of that bell-shaped curve associated with the standard normal distribution at 1.5, and that height is 0.129. Here is a second example. Once again, we're going to use the standard normal distribution. We will default the parameters, and in this case, we're going to evaluate it at 1.5. But this time, because the first letter of that distribution is a P, we know we're going to get the cumulative distribution function and this tells you that the area underneath the standard normal probability density function between negative infinity and 1.5 is 0.933. So this will get you cumulative distribution function values. The next letter to start one of these routines is the Q. So let's try Q norm. And this time what we do is we put in a probability. So let's put in 0.75. And when you do so, it comes back with 0.6744. What this says is the 75th percentile of the normal distribution is 0.6744. I'll do one more that's a Q norm. Let's put in 0.975. And when you do that, you get the famous 1.96 from statistics. And this says, if you look on the horizontal axis associated with the bell-shaped curve, again, centered at zero, standard deviation one, if you want the point along that horizontal axis that has an area of 0.975 to the left of it, that number is 1.96. Finally, if you say R norm of 12, that will give you 12 random variates from the standard normal distribution, and there they are. Remember, the standard normal distribution is centered around zero, so it's not surprising that some of those are negative and some are positive, and that's to be expected. Now, so far, we have ignored the two parameters, mu and sigma, and we've let them default. Let's say we want to generate 12 heights um, of people whose average height, say, is 5 foot 7, and the standard deviation of their heights is 3. There would be 12 heights drawn from that distribution, and you can see that they range from the high as 72, that's easy to pick off, 
looks like the low is 62, which is over here. So they range from five foot two to a little over six feet in terms of their heights. Well, that's the normal distribution. Let's try another distribution. In this case, let's try the binomial distribution. And in the case of the binomial distribution, you have two parameters, n and p. n is the number of Bernoulli trials, and p is the probability of success on each trial. So if we say d binome of 3, 6, 1 half, this particular statement is answering the following question. What is the probability of exactly three heads in six tosses of a fair coin? And that probability is 0 0.3125. Here is another one. I'm just going to do an up arrow and replace the D by a P. And here is the question that is being answered here. This says, what is the probability of three or fewer heads in six tosses of a fair coin? And that probability is 0.65625. Here is another one. Q norm of 0.96 and 1 half. The question that's, I didn't mean Q norm, I meant Q binome, binome for binomial. The question that's being asked here is, what is the 90th percentile of a binomial random variable with n equals 6 and p equals 1 half, and that 90th percentile turns out to be 5. Finally, the last one. If we say our binome, 3, 6, 1 half, this will throw three realizations of a binomial 6, 1 half experiment, which is equivalent to saying we're going to flip a fair coin six times and count the number of heads, and we're going to do that three times. We're going to run three experiments of that. And the first time we got four, and then we got two, and then we got four. You can put a much bigger number in there if you want to run this, for example, 30 times. There are the different outcomes. And you can see in some cases, we get no heads at all when six, there are six tosses of a fair coin. And that ran all the way up through five. But you can see they're going to be mainly twos, threes, and fours in here. The others are out in the tail of the distribution. Two more things before we leave this behind. I'm going to go to our UNIF. Should probably introduce that. This is the uniform distribution. And it has a lower bound. Sometimes they use A and B for these. A lower bound of 0 and an upper bound of 1 by default. The binomial distribution, for example, did not have defaults for n and p, but the uniform does. And so I'm going to go ahead and throw five uniform random variates. And I'll default the parameters 0 and 1. So all five of these numbers should fall between 0 and 1. And there they are. Now, if I'd use the up arrow and I repeat that command, I'll get a different set of uniform zero ones. There is a way, and it's called a random number seed, that I can repeat these, and that can be useful in simulation from time to time. And that way of doing so is to set a random number seed. Now, I can put any number I want in here. Um, it's going to be an integer to set the seed. So if I set the seed as 9, and then I generate five uniforms, there they are. Notice that those are different than the uh, first set that was generated. But then if I go back and I reset my seed and generate those uniforms, I get exactly the same numbers. 
So that has some use in terms of controlling the uniform zero ones where they're, they're starting and in Monte Carlo simulation, which we'll see a little bit later, that can be valuable. Finally, the last thing that I'm going to cover here is the sample function. And the, uh, the syntax here for the sample function is sample, and x will be the object that you're sampling from. Size will be the size of the statement. I'm sorry, the size of the sample. Replace will def be default to false, and this says, are you going to replace items? Are you sampling with replacement or not? And then you can put a probability vector out here if you want to sample in an uneven fashion with different probabilities. The default is they'll all be the same probability. Real simple, if I type in sample 7, what it will do is it will generate me a random permutation of the numbers 1 through 7. There's another thing you can do. You can say sample 5, and what it will do is it will sample 5 numbers without replacement from the first 7 in positive integers. Here's another one. I can say sample 7, 5, and now I can change that replace parameter, which defaulted to false. I can change it to true. When I do so, I am basically putting seven balls in an urn, numbered one through seven, and I'm drawing them out with replacement. And because I'm replacing them on each draw, I can get repeats. And you can see in this particular case, I got seven twice. Once here, I pulled the seven ball out of the urn, and then a little bit later, I pulled it again. In the default case, I can't get repeats. Here's another example. We'll say sample, again, 7, 5. This time I'm going to set up a probability vector, and I'm going to let it be 1 through 7 divided by 28. Now what that's saying is, I want to gather a sample of size 5, but I want to pull them, the, pull those balls out of the urn, the one ball with probability 1 28th, the two ball with probability 2 28ths, all the way up to the seven ball with probability 7 28ths. So what this says is the higher numbers are more likely. So we happened to get the one here, but we didn't get the two or the three. Let's try doing that one more time. Let's redo that command. I'll get a dis different result this time. Again, we got the one ball, very unlikely. One, two, and three, that's a rare sample there. This is a little more typical. You tend to get the higher numbers, as you can see here. They're not all equally likely in this particular case. Finally, the last one, you can say x is equal to, you can put in some strings here. You don't have to only sample from integers. You can also sample strings if you want. Put in the first six here. Check that. Looks good. So we could sample from this vector, and let's say we want 9, and we'll put in replace equals true. We have to put in replace equals true here because we're pulling 9 items out from those strings, and there are only 6 of them. So when you do so, that string there corresponds to 9 outcomes of the roll of a single fair die over and over nine times. So the first time we got a five, the next time a four, and then a one, a two, and a two, and a three, and a one, and a six, and a two, and that sampling. So this is it for probability. If you do a little more reading in the book, you'll see lots more examples 
of how to use these functions.